All right, so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the uh, the skeletal system and and articulations joints and how they they work together. Um, but as a quick review, the uh, you know the the skeletal system really provides a um, a framework that that determines our shape and our size. And you know we all come in different shapes and sizes, and, and everybody's skeletal system is a, a little bit different. Come uh, a couple of kind of fun fun facts that, that um, are you know, worth their weight in salt. Um, you can roughly predict the size of an adult if you double the, the height of, double their height at age two. So, you know, a child at, at age two who's 36 inches will probably be about six feet tall. Uh, the general shape and, 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 your, and your size is, is inherited, um, but there is a significant influence on uh, nutrition, activity levels, and, and postural habits. So we can have an impact on, on how tall we are uh, based on, on our nutrition habits. And if we look at, at various locations around the world, we'll see that a, a significant difference in, in, in shape and size based on, um, on adequate, uh, adequate nutrition. And, um, and bone is, is actually, we, we think of it as kind of this inner tissue, and it's actually really uh, dynamic. There's, it's constantly changing. There's constantly bone material being laid down, constantly bone material being, being uh, uh, absorbed. And bone will change its shape based on the demands that are, are, are placed on it. So there's, um, you know, there's this, this concept that... Um, that I can can have an impact on the shape of a bone by applying a load to it, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. So when I look at what are the the functions of the skeletal system, one is it provides a systems of uh, a system of, of levers that allow us to move through space, and the musculature generates the forces that 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 allow that motion to occur around an axis. So with the, the skeletal system and our joints and the muscular system providing those forces, we will create movement and the movement will be dependent upon the type of bone, the type of lever, and the type of joint that is at the end of the, of, of the joint, or at the end of the bone. The, um, the skeletal system provides uh, support to, 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 to maintain upright posture. Uh, again, if we apply a certain type of load, our posture can change, and our posture, a, a change in posture will have an impact on joint surface and joint function, and will have an impact on muscular function. Then lastly, our, our skeletal system will provide protection uh, of vital organs, so we can see how our ribs um, surround the, 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 the lungs and surround the, the heart to maintain um, protection during during uh, daily activities. We have different types of bones. Um, we have cortical bone, we have cancellous bone. Cortical bone is also called compact bone. It is um, much more dense. It tends to, to surround a long, the, a long bone and provides the stability. So that area would be the, the cortical area of the long bone. Um, we have cancellous bones or spongy bone and that is uh, an area of much greater porosity. So we have um, uh, much more mobility in, in, in the cancellous bone, much more stability in the compact bone. So we have different classifications of bone. Um, long bones are longer than they are wide. So a good example of a long bone is the humerus or the femur. Both of these are, are tibia, fibula. These are all examples of long bones. Um, the shaft will tend to, to widen toward the end. And that section is called the metiphysis. The metiphysis uh, is just before, and that's the where the growth plate occurs in, in adolescence. And the end of the bone is called the epiphysis. And... Um, and again, that area is what is, is, uh, is separated by the growth plate from the metiphysis. Short bones, examples of, of short bones would be the, the, uh, the talus in the foot. So again, 
Short bones, um, the, the tarsals are other example, they are primarily cancellous uh, or spongy bones covered with a thin layer of cortical bone. Flat bones are things like the ribs and the um, sternum. Primarily two layers of cortical bones with a, a, a layer of cancellous bone in between. And they are typically there functioning to protect internal structures um, and they offer bright you know, real broad areas for muscle attachment. In the, in the lower extremity, um, the, the pelvis is really a, the best example of a, of a, uh, of a flat bone. Um, irregular bones. Irregular bones are typically a thin layer of, of cortical uh, bones and, and um, that is surrounding the cancellous bones. The, they provide a, a, a variety of functions and the, and the best example is a, is a vertebrae. And you can t see by the, the example of our vertebrae, there are, is, is projections in, off of this bone, and there is, er, which are areas for muscular attachments and ligamentous attachments. There is the body of the vertebrae in the, in, in the end, which provides uh, an area to transmit forces and loads through. So uh, an, a, an irregular bone um, functions to help muscle attachments, ligaments uh, attachment, and, and a an, a significant uh, opportunity to transmit forces through the body and, and uh, absorb those forces. The last, the last example um, is uh, the patella, which is a, an example of a sesamoid bone. And sesamoid bones are, are really floating bones that um, The patella is really a floating bone that provides um, an, an, an opportunity to create an extended lever arm, as we talked about in the, in the last section. So if I can extend the lever, uh, the moment arm, the lever arm, I can create more torque around that axis. And that's the function of the patella. Uh, there's also um, a couple of sesamoids in the first metatarsal or MTP joint, metatarsal phalangeal joint, that provides uh, a, uh, uh, an increased distance between the axis of rotation and the and the um, the flexor hollicis uh, uh, brevis tendon so as I had mentioned earlier there is a uh, an issue of um, how the biomechanical characteristics of the bone will change and this is an example of Wolf's law um, Wolf's Law essentially states that for every change in form and function of a bone or their function alone is followed by a certain definitive change in their internal architecture. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big way of saying if we apply a load, the load's going to, to change the shape of the bone. And, and this is a, an example of, of Osgood slaughters where the tibial tuberosity on this individual has has grown excessively as a as a result of the of the tensile load of the patellar tendon at where it, it attaches to the uh, where it attaches to the uh, to the tibial tuberosity. Physical activity will also have a big function of um, on on how our bones react. We know that um, that we can increase the the density of, of bone with weight bearing exercise. So for individuals that are at risk or, or, or have osteoporosis or osteopenia, we know that we can increase their bone density with weight bearing and weight lifting uh, activities. Um, the same thing, we can expect that a, an individual who is laying in bed is gonna lose bone density. And one of the biggest challenges that our astronauts have is they lose an excessive amount of bone density extremely rapidly when they're in space. So when they get back to Earth, they have lost significant uh, bone structure. Um, so physical activity will have a big impact and, and on bone function and loads, stresses will have a big impact um, on, on the, the bony architecture, skeletal architecture. Which leads us to this, this concept of the strength and the stiffness of bone. And we can look at strength and stiffness as a function of a stress-strain curve. 
every tissue that we know will we can plot against a stress and strain. Stress is another way of saying load. Strain is another way of saying change in shape or deformation in shape. So if I apply a load along my stress lane, I'm going to have a, a definitive change in shape. Now if that change in shape makes it up to the yield point and I then remove the stress or I remove the load, the material, or in this case the bone, will, will return to its normal resting uh, shape. So we won't have a permanent change in shape. If I end up beyond the yield point, beyond the yield point I start to see the, a curve occurring in my stress strain curve. So it takes much less load, much less stress to create a, a, a faster, more significant change in the deformation or the strain or the shape and will occur until I finally reach a point of ultimate stress where I'll see a big change in shape with very little change in, in load until it finally fractures completely. And, um, and that position between the yield point and the failure point is called the plastic region in that when we release the load it's not going to return to its original shape. So the, the, the slope of this line this allows us to really identify uh, the, the, the stiffness and the strength of whatever the material is. So in this case, um, the material being bone, we could have a, a, a higher sloping curve would be a stiffer uh, or a lower sloping curve would be a more elastic type of uh, more pliable type of, of bone and we can have bones that are stiffer and we have bones that are more pliable anisotropic characteristics of bone I love saying that word because it's a, it's a mouthful which really means that the shape of our stress strain curve will change depending on the direction that we apply the load so I take the same bone, you know, let's pretend this is my femur, and I apply a, a compression load. So I apply a vertical load through the bone. I will have the greatest strength and the greatest stiffness. So I can resist that load best through the bone when I apply it in a longitudinal fashion. As opposed to a transverse fashion, and I look down here, I'm going to have the most pliability and the, the, the earliest uh, fracture point. So we'll see fractures occurring much more often when I have a, a lateral load than when I have a compressive load. And when I start moving from that, that horizontal load to a, a load at 60 degrees, I may gain a little bit of stiffness and gain a little bit of strength. When I go uh, to that 30 degrees closer to a vertical position, I'm going to, I'm going to have increased uh, stiffness increased uh, strength. But when I'm looking at bone, the greatest amount of, of load and the greatest amount of stiffness uh, is, occurs in the bone when, when a load is applied uh, longitudinally through, the, you know, through a compression type of, of uh, direction. So viscoelastic characteristics means that the, the bone will the, the stress strain or the load and deformation or the load and displacement will vary depending on how fast I apply the load. So I apply a load quickly and the, 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 the bone will respond to that if I have uh, with, with, with better stiffness, uh, better strength. If I apply the load slowly over a longer period of time, it takes less load and I get greater displacement and a longer displacement before I have a complete fracture. So viscoelasticity of, uh, and viscoelastic characteristics really relate to the, um, the velocity of the load that we apply. So we can apply loads in different, different uh, directions, different types. So as we, we mentioned um, a minute ago, we talked about compressive forces and compressive forces 
have loads going vertically through through the bone. So best example in, in my femur here is I'm weight bearing through the bone and I get ground reaction forces coming up, uh, mass coming down. So typical, uh, typical compression force. Um, tensile forces are just the opposite. So I have a load moving away from the middle of the bone. So I'm stretching the bone at its, at lo at its long ends. And you're going to say, well, well that, when does that ever happen? That never happens. You know, when is, when is a bone being pulled apart? Well, every time you have a muscle attachment that is creating a, um, the, a, a, a force to allow the motion to occur through a joint, there is a reactive position, a reactive, a, a, a reactive force that is going to be parallel to the long axis and there will be a force that is perpendicular to the long axis. Uh, so we all we have tensile forces occurring on on bones all the time with muscle contractions. A shear force, we have two forces that are moving in opposite directions that are perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. Uh, and we these are, are forces that would um, are are typically external forces that, that you know, we may end up with, with seeing some kind of bad things happening with fractures uh, and injuries. Um, torsional forces, torsional forces occurring with with a twisting motion, with one in one one direction of the bone being pulled in an opposite direction from the long axis. So, and then lastly, we've got um, compression and and um, and tensile forces occurring. Compression on one side, tensile on the other side creates a bending type of force, bending type of movement. So when I look at um, when I look at at injury in, in health, we talked about how the we talked about how the muscular activity, we talked about how the bone will adapt to to changes in uh, in forces that are, that are applied to it. When I have a, a high stress and a relatively low repetition um, that is in a sets up a situation where I may have a chance for injury so that's the traumatic uh, boot top top fracture where somebody's uh, skiing down down a slope and, and catches they catch a, catch an edge and their ski goes one direction their tibia goes a different direction and High enough force with one repetition creates an injury, creates a fracture, and we have that bending uh, mechanism or that shearing mechanism, either one, and the bone fractures. The uh, the other type of of um, injury we may see is is with a low stress, a low load, but it happens with excessive repetition, and we can have that occurring within a certain area under the curve, which maintains health. But if we ex have an excessive amount of stress and or an excessive amount of repetition, we may end up uh, outside this curve. And this is where we start to see bony breakdown with stress fractures occurring from repetitive motion, typically low level, but enough repetition, low level stress but with enough repetition that creates, a, uh, that creates a fracture. And it may be, initially may be pain, but as that bone weakens and they and an athlete continues to to work through that 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 stress reaction that stress fracture that can turn into a high stress one repetition fracture that occurs because with it with what would no, what we would think of as a normal activity that creates a fracture from the weakened bone so the bone material is not being laid down the bone material is being absorbed bone becomes weak and fractures with with one act uh, with one uh, one repetition, one activity.